Welcome to Math 31. This is a lesson on antiderivatives and the integrals. Uh, lesson 1 for Unit 7. And the antiderivatives that we're going to look at are going to be the reverse operation of differentiation that we've been working with earlier. So it's not really introducing anything new, it's just the direction is going to change. So once you get used to it, it's a very natural operation. It really does open up a whole new world of possibilities with um, what they call the integral. So I'm going to take a look at a few questions, just develop some basic sense and then of the properties, and then get the rules that we're going to work with. So it's beginning, here's a pretty regular looking function. f at x is equal to 2x to the 4 plus 7. So if we were to differentiate this, we'd get f prime at x is equal to 8x to the 3. Seems pretty straightforward. So if we work backwards with this, so if big f at x is equal to 8x to the 3, now that is the derivative, and we want to get the antiderivative of y equal big f at x. So in other words, the reverse operation. So this should be taking us right back to the beginning, where we started with what the original function was. So we're given the answer, and we're trying to find the question. And also be aware that f prime at x, little f prime at x, is I'm replacing with big f at x. A little confusing with the notation, but this is a short-term problem. Eventually, we introduce notation that uh, takes the issue right out of it. So therefore, if y equal little f at x is the antiderivative of y equal big f at x, then this statement's going to be true. f at x, the antiderivative, is 2x to the 4, say, plus 3. Or 2x to the 4 minus 1, because both of those functions have the derivative of 8x to the 3. But you see what the problem is, it's that constant term. Because when you take the derivative of a 3 or a negative 1 or a 7, it's 0. So we can't nail it down exactly what the constant is. And if you think of this, or when we look at this graphically in a few seconds, it will make sense. So what we're going to have to do when we're looking for antiderivatives is indicate the plus c, which is plus a constant. And that's all we can do unless we have more information. And eventually we do get more information. So let's have a look at some graphs for this. And this might shed a little bit of light on the whole antiderivative issue. Keeping in mind that the derivative represents the slope of the tangent line. Very important. So if we took a, took a look at some of these, um, these functions, say 2x to the 4 plus 3, and then 2x to the 4 minus 1, we should be able to recognize the pattern of the whole thing. So the upper graph is 2x to the 4 minus, or excuse me, plus 3. So 2x to the 4 plus, four. oops. Okay, I'll fix that. It should be 2x to the 4 plus 3, and then the bottom one is 2x to the 4 minus 1. There we go. And the derivative is the slope of the tangent line, so because these graphs are identical in shape, it would mean that for all x values, the slope of the tangent line is going to be identical. So it doesn't matter which one you do, y is equal to 2x to the 4 plus 3, and y is equal to 2x to the 4 minus 1. I mean, the slope of the tangent line will be identical. So therefore, the derivative is the same, which we know to be 8x to the 3. Write that 
times y prime, I should say. Oops, I mean 8x to the 3. Okay, so this is an important concept with it, with the antiderivative. The other observation we should make is that this the antiderivative as a result is not going to be unique. So we always run into the issue of uh, the constant term. Doesn't end up being a huge problem though, as you'll see when we get deeper into the unit. So let's formalize this. So a function that little f is the antiderivative of another function big F if little f prime x equal big F at x. So in other words, the general antiderivative of any function y equal big F at x is y is equal to little f at x plus c. Now the use of big F and little f is arbitrary. Some books do the reverse. It doesn't really matter as long as you're comfortable with the pattern. Um, but here's a few questions to work through just to get a sense of this. Now we, we're going to run into problems very soon. But this one, I'm going to use the fumble method. I'm just going to Armstrong my way through and come up with an answer based on general patterns. And you should worry a little bit about this because the fumble method isn't totally reliable. But for simple problems, we can use it. So all I'm doing is recognizing the, the issue that the, if x squared plus x is the derivative, the original function had to have x to the 3 because you, you, know, you go down by 1. And then we need a coefficient that's going to cancel out that 3 in the exponent when they get multiplied. So it has to be 1 third. And the same pattern would be true here because it's x to the 1. We add 1 on x to the 2. And then we need a coefficient that's going to cancel that 2. So that's 1 over 2. And we also have to make sure we have our plus c. And um, these ones... So I'm going to write this as little f at x to indicate that it's the antiderivative. These ones are easy to check. If you think you did it wrong, you just differentiate your answer, and it should take you right back to the original. Now let's go on to a trig one. Big f at x is cos x. So you've got to think, if the derivative is cos x, what is the original function? So I'll write that as little f at x, and that's equal to the sine of x plus c because the derivative of sine is equal to cosine. You're not sure? Differentiate your answer and see if it takes you back to where you started. Now, we should get a better method for these, so let's take a look at what is called the power rule for antiderivatives. So the general antiderivative of any function, big f at x, and yeah, that, that's a polynomial function with n being a rational, or excuse me, a real number and n not equal to negative 1. You'll see why soon. We've got a general pattern. Now I did describe this as a polynomial function, but of course that's not totally true. That would, this would be true for algebraic ones as well. So um, the key is the exponent. You add one on, and then the number that you added on, your new exponent, becomes the denominator and then the a, the, the original coefficient, just stays there. Of course, you have to simplify the term, but this is a very reliable method for algebraic terms, and it warrants a little box around it, too. So let's try number three using this. So big f at x is equal to this polynomial term, so little f at x we add 1 to the exponent. So always start with the exponent. So that's x to the 6. And that exponent becomes the denominator. So the 4 just stays as a passenger. We'll simplify it later. Same deal with this x to the 2. x to the 3 becomes our exponent. And the long way of doing it is writing it 2 thirds divided by 3. That can be short, shortened quite a bit. Same thing with 5x. Add 1 on and you get x to the 2. And so it's 5 over 2. Don't forget plus c. When you simplify it now, 4 over 6, of course, is 2 thirds x to the 6. And then off to the side, if you take that 2 thirds divided by 3, that's 2 thirds times 1 third, 
So that's going to be 2 over 9. Now, I would expect most people to go there directly instead of lingering over that step. You want to not expend a lot of time. So normally, 2 thirds times 1 third right away, you'll get your 2 over 9. And that is a 3. And then plus 5 over 2, x to the 2, plus c. And once again, the check is useful. First time I've actually done this. Take the derivative of your answer. And it has to take you right back to where you started. So we would get 2 thirds times 6, which is 12 over 3. No, 12 over 3 is just 4. And then go down by one exponent, 4x to the 5. Same thing here, 2 ninths times 3, 6 over 9, which reduces down to 2 over 3. And then the last one, 5 times 2 is 10 over 2, so that's 5x. We did it. So we know we have this one done. So check where necessary. I wouldn't, now if there's simple problems, you probably won't feel you have to, but if you have any doubts about it, do so. And everything else goes as we have typically done for differentiation. So 7 over x to the 3, we would write a 7x to the negative 3, and then the regular rule still applies. Now that is a big F, and this is a small one. So add 1 on, you get x to the negative 2. So that's 7 divided by negative 2. Your exponent becomes your denominator, and of course, plus c. So little f at x is equal to negative 7 over 2, x to the negative 2 plus c. Now, I'm not going to bother writing that with a positive exponent, but you could write it as 7 over 2x squared. Well, let's check this one out. Does not bother. So big F at x is equal to cube root of x. So big F at x is equal to x to the one third. So this has got a fractional exponent. Shouldn't be a big problem though. When we take the derivative of it, or excuse me, antiderivative of it, it becomes x to the add one, which is three over three, gives you x to the four thirds. And that's one divided by four thirds. Now that step we want a shortcut as well, plus c. So when you go 1 divided by 4 thirds, that's going to be 3 over 4 x to the 4 thirds plus c. Now what you normally would do, when you see that your denominator is 4 thirds, you can go directly to 3 over 4, because 1 divided by that is just the reciprocal. And I would recommend that um, particular method. This one's a little more complicated because already we're seeing a bracketed expression and that's not normally good news because if you get a derivative like this with a bracket it means that you might have been using the chain rule to get that. So let's keep our eyes open on this. So this is x plus 4 to the 2 thirds, that's routine. Let's play dumb with it, even though we got that bracket, that x plus 4. So I'm going to take the antiderivative of this using the same rules we have always used. And then hope for the best. So little f at x is equal to, well, x plus 4, add 3 over 3, and you'll get 5 over 3 for your new exponent. And then 3 over 2 becomes, or sorry, 3 over 5 becomes our, our um, coefficient plus c. So let's check. Just to see that we did this one right, take that answer and differentiate it. So it becomes, subtract 1, x plus 4 to the 2 thirds times 1.
And the key is that the, the, the derivative of that x plus 4 is 1. So that doesn't cause any problems. Now, um, had that been a different polynomial inside the brackets, we would have had a problem with that. And so you'll see with this one, we also have a bracketed expression, 2 minus x to the 1 half. So play dumb with it, but I'm a little worried about this one. So I get 2 minus x when I take the antiderivative, add 1 on, and I get 3 over 2, and then 2 thirds in the front plus c. And that's OK. But when I do a check right now, and I take the answer, and then I differentiate it, So 2 thirds times 3 halves is going to be 1, and then 2 minus x to the 1 half. But in this case, the derivative of the inner is negative 1. So the answer is actually be negative square root of 2 minus x. And we actually have a positive. So all we do is adjust our answer. Now, that you should worry a little bit about this, because nobody likes to be doing adjustments too often. But this one will make sense. As I said, later on, we do develop a method for it. Um, but this then becomes our answer. And the 2 minus x, it's because the derivative of that binomial is negative 1. That's why we had to insert or adjust by putting the negative 1 on. The previous question, which was x plus 4, where the derivative was just 1, so it didn't affect anything. But you need to be careful, because if you did have in the bracket, say, 2x to the squared minus 9x, you have to be aware of those of the derivative of that part. So eventually it gets to be a problem. But so far we can get by just with a few little adjustments in the final stages. Let's go forward. And then what you've been waiting for, of course, is the trig functions. We looked at one earlier, but uh, let's try to make sense and get some rules for the basic trig functions, so sine and cosine. So I'm going to start with differentiating a sine function like this. So not the antiderivative, just the regular derivative. So f prime at x would be equal to, well, we have that factor of 1 over 5 in front. The derivative of sine 5x is cos 5x, but then we have to multiply by the derivative of the inner, so times 5. So f prime at x is equal to cos of 5x. So that would mean that the antiderivative of cos 5x would be what we started with, 1 over 5 sine 5x. And the issue is going to be that coefficient with the x in the argument and how we're going to make sense of that one and how we can sort of generalize it. So let's make this observation. So if we had big F at x is equal to cos 5x, it would mean that the antiderivative would be the original question, 1 over 5 sine 5x plus c. So that issue is that coefficient and its relationship to the 5. And it's a pretty simple one, because all we do is we take that 5 inside the cosine function, and then we um, write that as the, uh, the denominator. So it'll cancel out, in effect. And then, of course, don't forget that the antiderivative of cos is going to be the sine. So you're doing the reverse operation from differentiation, so you've got to be really careful, because all you're doing is going back and forth from cos to sine. So let's see what we can get. Generalize these. I've got the two functions written as cos or sine. And um, the antiderivative of the cos kx function is 1 over k sine kx plus c. So that's all we have to do to get rid of that factor with the x. Now, sine, be careful. The antiderivative of the sine function, you have to remember that what function has a derivative equal to sine? And of course, that's cosine. But the, also keep in mind that the derivative of cosine is negative, um, negative sine. So we deal with it by putting a negative in front of it. 
So the antiderivative of sine kx is negative 1 over k, a negative to deal with a negative, and cos kx plus c. So if you keep these rules around until you get them completely memorized or internalized, you'll be fine. So let's try a couple trig ones, getting the general antiderivatives of the following. So the first is big F at x is equal to 3 cos 2x. So the antiderivative, well, the 3 is going to be there, of course. But the antiderivative of cos 2x, according to what we just saw, would have to be the sine of 2x, and then whatever adjustments needed to be made. So the sine of 2x is the antiderivative of cos 2x, and then 1 over 2, one o and then 3, and then plus c. So therefore, f at x is equal to 3 over 2 sine 2x plus c. Not sure? Check it out. So that's 3 over 2. We differentiate the answer. So 3 over 2, the derivative of sine 2x is cos 2x, and then times 2. And then, of course, the 3 over 2, and the 2 will, will uh, simplify to 3 cos 2x. So we did it. We've got it. So fairly easy to check. Now, the next one's more complicated, but as long as you keep those patterns in front of you, no big deal. So a lot's going on with this one. You wouldn't want to fumble your way through. So we note that uh, the antiderivative of sine um, 2 thirds x is, okay, cos of 2 thirds x. Be careful, that's because the derivative of cos is sine. But we have to include the fact that it's the antiderivative of sine is negative. So we have to put the negative there. And we also have to put, remember, 1 over k would be 1 over 3, 2 over 3, 3 halves. And then we just multiply that out by the existing coefficient, of course, plus c. So the antiderivative, f at x, is equal to, multiply that one out, and you get a positive 9 over 10 cosine of 2 thirds x, and then plus c. and then do a check just to make sure everything's okay. So 9 over 10 times the negative sine of 2 thirds x and then times 2 thirds. And then multiply that 9 over 10 times the 2 thirds negative 3 over 5. Feeling pretty good about this one. Sine 2 thirds x, that's what we want. So it's a very reliable method. You need to do enough of them so you're confident. So this is going to take care of this exercise. Um, we go on further to differential equations, so playing around with these a bit, and then eventually get on to more complex setups. Because you can see we're limited. But this is the first lesson, so thank you for your time.